Hello and welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. Through these sessions, we hope to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools. And in sharing information from local and international peers, the Australian Biocommons aims to support bioscientists to deliver world-leading environmental, agricultural and medical research. My name's Christina Hall and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Manager. We really appreciate those of you joining us live today. You'll have the opportunity to ask our speaker questions via the Q&A function on your dashboard, and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. This session will be recorded if you'd like to revisit it in the future, and you'll find it on our YouTube channel, along with recordings of previous webinars and workshops. We also hope you'll keep in touch to hear about future webinars via the channels listed on the screen. And before we start today, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. With us today is Associate Professor Andrew Loney. Andrew is the Director of the Australian Biocommons and Associate Professor at the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences and the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne. Andrew has a background in molecular biology and computer science and started his career with a PhD in molecular genetics. Previously, Andrew directed the Victorian Life Sciences Computation Initiative and then Melbourne Bioinformatics. And between 2010 and 2019, he established and coordinated the Masters of Science in Bioinformatics program at the University of Melbourne. Andrew now coordinates a group of bioinformaticians and e-research specialists to collaborate with and support life science researchers in a variety of research infrastructure projects across Australia. And that's what we'll hear about today. What is the Australian Biocommons? Great, thanks a lot, Christina. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm gonna get straight into it because I've got about 60 slides for a 45 minute presentation. Um, so I'm gonna hit it hard. So, Everyone who's listening to this webinar, either live at the moment or into the future, is going to know that the reason we're here is because there's just been these enormous changes in how we go about measuring things in biology, biomedicine. And in some ways, it's become trivial to do what used to be really hard, which was to get uh, lots of baseline information, particularly at the molecular level. And you know, we've, we've got names across genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. There are new ones now with fluxomics and multiomics. Um, Getting the data is now easy, it used to be hard, and of course that pushes the problem space into understanding the data. And supporting aggregation and sharing of the data, and this uh, chart is from uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, growth of data, it hosted by EBI, and their data resources, uh, obviously an enormous amount, 160 petabytes. Um, they're, they're hosting at the moment, and um, just the rate at which is increasing because it's an exponential, um, uh, scale on the left there is enormous. So this is the context, I guess, in which we find ourselves uh, as modern day biologists and bioinformaticians. How do we take what the enormous amount of data that's now relatively easy to produce um, and interpret against the even larger amount of data that's um, uh, stored and shared worldwide using you know, a variety of rapidly changing tools um, and, um, and complex computational infrastructure? And how do we get trained for that? So Australia, I tell this joke every time, I'm gonna say it again, Australia is not an island. It exists in a much broader global context of developments in this space. Um, much of it, as you would expect, uh, eventuating or, or coming out of Europe and the US. Um, EBI are major data hosters, NCBI at the National Institutes of Health are major um, data hosters, global data hosters. But there are increasingly a number of global scale initiatives and collaborations which are really about how do we address the research building and making available the research infrastructure that we need in order to continue doing the great research that we're doing and being globally competitive. And that's of course coming from uh, every country, every research into a country in the world. So some of these you will have heard of, the Galaxy Project, we'll talk about that a bit later, EBI of course, um, Elixir, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, the Cancer Genome Atlas, an enormous um, aggregation of cancer genomic data and interpretation on top of that. Big data to knowledge initiative through the National Institutes of Health, which is now known as the Data Commons. 
um, the National Cancer Institute's Genomic Data Commons, um, Cyverse, and other really major investments that are being well supported, well funded um, through uh, either top down or sort of you know bottom up grant driven processes and um, consortiums. This is a, a slide that I've taken from an Elixir presentation. Um, Elixir is a federation of European research infrastructure efforts. Uh, basically, it's a group of countries, I think 25 now, European countries that have joined together in a federation to say, how do we share the things that we are building in terms of data and compute and, and, and standards and tools and training and skills and work together as one. Um, very, very effective, I think, and I'll talk a little bit more about Lixa later on. Um, this is a slide which I've taken most of the content from the National Institutes of Health Data Commons program. Um, this is really depicting a very ambitious program, which is more of a top-down program for the National Institutes of Health, in establishing a, a, a series of platforms on the left of your screen as you're looking there, user portals and workspaces, tools and workflows, and of course search and authentication services and whatnot, sitting across uh, enormous NIH-funded data, data sets, some of which appear on the right there, TopMed, GTEx, and the Model Organism Databases, you've all heard of some of these all of which in turn is sitting on top of cloud. Um, and in the case of the NIH efforts in this space, uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud are their major cloud platforms to support what they're doing. At the top there, we've got some examples of sophisticated workflow platforms. Um, Galaxy is one and FireCloud is one in the middle, uh, now known as Terra and developed by the Broad Institute for their um, enormous scale human genomic um, initiatives. One more slide, just to set a bit of context. This is taken from the National Cancer Institute's um, development of a cancer research data commons. They already have a genomic data commons there in the middle of this cloud, and they are building imaging data commons, uh, proteomic data commons, uh, clinical trial commons. And the idea is that all of these things will interoperate. And around the, the, um, the edges there, we have the, the user-facing services, computational workspaces, tool repositories, elastic compute, data dictionaries and models and whatnot. Uh, the idea is this all becomes one integrated data commons from which some very sophisticated research can be done and the NCI are probably leading in the world, I would say, in developing this very sophisticated infrastructure. Okay, I'm just going to check the time. Nine past, not too bad. Okay, so what does Australia do in response to, um, you know, both the context and the investments and the efforts that are going on globally? Um, and we, we are in a good space at the moment um, because the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme, which is the major funding body for research infrastructure in Australia, has made some really big investments in both digital data and e-research platforms, which they identified as a top priority in the recent roadmap, and in complex biology, um, and complex biology in the broader sense, but certainly with a very strong bioinformatics component to it. So some extra monies have flowed into digital data and research platforms and complex biology over the 2018 to 2022 period. And that leaves us in a good position to consider how do we relate to what's happening globally and how do we invest this money very sensibly for the benefit of Australian researchers so that we can maintain competitive, competitiveness when we can't really compete um, on, on pure funding. Um, but what we can do is be clever with the money that we have um, and work out how we can respond to you know, things like Elixir and things like the National Institutes of Health Data Commons and whatnot in a way that benefits Australia um, but also helps us participate in these global initiatives. Okay, so it's useful for us to understand Australia's life science research community, life science, biology, um, the same thing, we're using the terms interchangeably, because this allows us to take a quantitative approach to understanding how we might invest the money that's available through NCRIS in helpful ways for Australian researchers and how we categorise really our responses um, and budget for them so that they're appropriate for the, um, the, the sub-communities within the total research community. Now, I've presented this a lot of times at different forums, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly because I want to get to the meat of what we're doing in the BioCommons. But nevertheless, 100,000 researchers in Australia across all disciplines. About a third of those are in bioscience, that is biomedical and biological um, research, plus around 200,000 students um, research higher degree, particularly, there's a lot of students supporting these 30,000 researchers. So in this case, re researchers are, are essentially lab leaders and, and postdocs, and then under the, um, alongside those, we have PhD students and masters by research. 
this is the, these proportions are true of any research mature community. So it will be the same in Europe, except scaled up 20 fold, and the same in the US, except scaled up 15 fold. In terms of what's the sub discipline, I guess, that these researchers are involved in, we normally use these uh, percentages 50%, that is 15,000 to 30,000 involved in biomedical and health research, 30% in agriculture, and 20% in environment. These proportions actually change depending on what country you go to. And in fact, if you were going to France, for instance, you'd see a larger proportion in agriculture. If you were go to the UK, you'd see a larger proportion in biomedicine. Now, this is where we think we've added some value in the initial stages of the biocommons. Um, in trying to understand the expertise types of those researchers and where we think that's going into the future so that we can do some mapping from funding and requirements across to the communities or capabilities, I guess. And at the moment, we see four groups of researchers. Wet lab researchers, um, who are people who are not doing much bioinformatics, but might, for instance, use a BLAST service online. An increasing number of data intensive researchers who are still primarily wet lab based, but are doing more and more with, um, with um, genomics and, and proteomics and metabolomics, um, dipping their toe in the water, if you like, perhaps doing an RA-seq experiment to characterize their cell of, of interest or whatever. This third group here is a bioinformatics intensive group um, and the, off, well characterized by cancer researchers, where often there's not much wet lab work, but there's an enormous amount of uh, bioinformatics focused work, particularly around you know, genomic characterization of cancer drivers. And the fourth group there, and I hope there's a few of these on the call today, um, are bioinformaticians uh, who are a, a really interesting place at the moment, where essentially they are the, um, the magicians who are able to take digital data and turn it into knowledge and papers, um, working in collaboration with, you know, with the other three groups. We can put some numbers to these groups. Um, at the moment, we believe about two thirds of biology researchers are still mostly wet lab based, about 7,000 of the 30,000 uh, starting to use data intensive methods and um, techniques, about 2,000 in this bio intensive bioscience researcher category, that is the people who are almost purely using bioinformatics um, as their method of, of research and about a thousand bioinformaticians around the country. Um, and if we look ahead to five years time, this is where we can go on, that there'll be less people only doing wet lab. There'll be more people doing some bioinformatics. There'll be more people doing only bioinformatics and there'll be some more bioinformaticians. And of course, we're all trying to, to churn out new bioinformaticians as quickly as we can, but it's not fast enough. So you can see that there's these broad transitions happening um, that are going to impact you know, what Australia needs to do in terms of training and research infrastructure, but what we know is coming, which is more data and um, more people requiring the research infrastructure that allows them to do world-class bioinformatics-based research. A couple of years ago, um, we did a fairly intensive consultation around the country um, in collaboration with Bioplatforms Australia, um, a number of, city, of research precincts we visited and, and got together groups of research leaders and, and research practitioners across those research precincts and asked them, you know, again, here's the position we're in, there's potential for funding down the line. This was before the increased funding had actually been made available. Um, we know this is happening in the world. We know this is Australia's quantitative position. What do you think are the major challenges here? We had an international science advisory group, which was um, uh, really, really excellent and high quality. With a national reference group of uh, mostly directors of research institutes. Um, and we went on an international study tour and visited a bunch of places across Europe and then across the US that were leaders in what we would call sort of bioscience as data science. And we came back from that with some conclusions and they were these. Cloud first, that is uh, research infrastructure which is based on cloud is pervasive across the EU and the US, particularly the US. Uh, in the US, there's very close partnerships with commercial cloud providers, not so much in the EU for various reasons. It's the concept of aggregating data, uh, standards driven data into this idea of a commons where people can log in and get access to a broad set of data, which is interoperable, is very, very strong in the US. Uh, it's focused on data and method sharing. It's also very challenging, but it's very strong and a lot of support for that, for that top down from the National Institutes of Health. Elixir, which is again this sort of federation body tying together the national efforts in bioinformatics uh, research infrastructure across Europe, 
um, was doing a very, very good job of coordinating, we'll call it data infrastructure. It's really bioinformatics infrastructure, you know, data and method sharing across Europe. And Elixir and EBI, who are uh, very closely related um, and on the same campus, uh, both have a compute strategy that is very, very family cloud focused as well. Um, not so much on the commercial cloud providers, more around institutional um, and, and academic cloud. So federated approaches to data infrastructure are developing um, and becoming more accessible. And I'll talk about that if I get a chance a bit later, although I see I'm using up too much time already. And um, we concluded that national bioinformatics infrastructure initiatives can deliver benefits across um, clearly for the research uh, community itself, but also industry engagement. And this is something I'd never seen before, but it's quite clear in, in Europe and Germany, particularly that um, if you can get this stuff right, you can actually start up industries of biological data science around the academic data sets and um, data assets. We also saw widespread uptake of Galaxy as a workflow platform across the National Institutes of Health and Europe. And I'll talk a bit about that in a second. So from these, we derived a set of principles for this, uh, the Australian Bio Commons. And at, at this stage, um, we had just learned that we had, uh, through BioPlatforms Australia, um, been successful in, um, in getting some funding to establish a Bio Commons. And therefore, um, it, it, it made sense to sort of formalise the structures and the things that we were talking about into a set of uh, principles. We also have a mission, which is a bit dry. It's on the website if you're going to go have a look. I think the principles are more, uh, more interesting. Um, the first one's an no-brainer, a national focus on capabilities and communities. The second one was really important. And this is a basic funda uh, fundamental principle. As a, as a country, Australia needs to partner internationally um, and participate in and contribute to the larger critical mass efforts where, where possible, because we just can't afford to compete in building and delivering our own platforms from scratch and supporting our own platforms from scratch in the light of these enormous investments that are being made internationally. Of course, we want to build software and expertise capability that's going to reduce duplication of infrastructure management um, and use in Australia. And look, the reality is that most of bioinformatics, much of bioinformatics is still really a cottage industry where each lab sort of is responsible for their own environment and their own uh, infrastructure, or digital re uh, research infrastructure environment. And in all honesty, most people are doing a lot of the same stuff. Um, and if we can find ways to consolidate across that and reduce duplication of that through national infrastructure investment, we should. And we should do that by promoting the development of and building on high throughput cloud infrastructure that is interoperable with everything that is happening internationally. So that will allow us to streamline the exchange of tools, workflows, data and training and expertise, both nationally and internationally. And that last one is really summing up what the Bio Commons is about. The aim of the ultimate aim of the BioCommons is to do that last one, is to streamline the exchange of the assets that we use in bioinformatics now, tools, workflows, data assets, training and expertise, so that we can seamlessly exchange those within institutes and between groups in Australia and without of Australia. Okay, what aren't we? The BioCommons, we're not going to establish a big new computing centre. We're not buying any computers. The reason for that is because um, what we want to do is describe ways in which tools and data um, and workflows can be shared across existing compute facilities, both within Australia and without. And we know that there's significant international investment in research, yeah, sorry, national investment in research uh, infrastructure, computing research infrastructure in Australia. Uh, we know about the NCI, the National Computing Infrastructure at ANU, the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre, and of course the Australian Research Data Commons. We're partnering with all those guys, including ARNET and AAF, and institutional providers too, through USIF and, um, and Melbourne University here and others. So that what we do is coordinate um, and apply standards rather than build new things. Okay, so I think I've just said all that. Galaxy is a good example of this. Galaxy at the moment is running on resources at QCIF, the University of Melbourne and NCI and the ARDC and it's working very, very well. Um, we don't need to buy new stuff, that capacity is available. What we need to do is define the platform that sits on top of it and manage that and make it available with the training for the largest group possible so that they can uh, do the research uh, as quickly as, um, as, they, as they need to. Okay, I'm just going to skip over that. Okay, secondly, and really critically, the BioCommons is a research infrastructure initiative. It's not a bioinformatics service. We're not going to do any bioinformatics. Um, the idea is that we provide the tools, the resources, the, the infrastructure that's needed for everybody who is uh, 
doing this research, bioinformatics dependent research in Australia, um, to be well competitive. So part of that is through reduction of duplication of infrastructure, part of it is through training, um, part of it is through uh, really strong international engagement and bringing over, if you like, the assets of, of bioinformatics infrastructure to Australia and making them widely accessible as quickly as possible. This diagram is a, a it's a, a, a pictorial representation of what we what we see, and it's most, maybe it's mostly useful internally in the biocommons, but nevertheless, we've got this concept of a biocloud, which is really the set of computing resources and network and um, capabilities that we see our platforms and our, our, our tools sitting on, these assets that we're exchanging. Um, we've got a, um, an investment in leadership and governance, which is really the coordination part of the biocommons. And, um, and then that's myself and Christina and, and Jeff Christensen and others um, who are trying to, to make these things happen. And I'll talk about exactly what some of those things are in a sec. This concept of continuous pathfinding, where we go out and ask the community, what's the common bit of infrastructure, research infrastructure here, um, digital research infrastructure that's missing that we could agree on as a community and then implement? And those make their way into these domain applications and services, which is gradually increasing in capability and capacity as we continuously find new things to, um, uh, to, to sort of agree on and then implement. Our funding window through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme is for five years. And uh, our primary investor is, of course, Bioplatforms Australia, a $20 million investment which has come down through increase through the complex biology priority to Bioplatforms Australia and is now being invested through the Biocommons initiative um, over 2019 to 2023. Um, it's um, a, a good amount of money for us to establish this sort of um, collaborative, I guess, this consortium. It's not enough money to go out and build a new thing. We can't build an EBI with this sort of money. EBI, the budget is you know, in the realm of $150 million a year, but we can do good coordination with this um, and we think that we can um, really establish something quite significant by using this money to coordinate and to enable things to happen from the institutes and the national capabilities that already exist. Okay. So at the moment, uh, we've got co-investment from uh, a number of partners, um, particularly the Australian Research Data Commons, which is another INCRIS facility, um, 2.5 million invested through the uh, platforms program, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and um, in this platforms program, which describes a suite of work around, you know, tool exchange and agreement on standards and, and compute platforms for, um, for enabling, enabling asset exchange. Uh, we, so far, I've got about $8 million in con contributions from institutions and other national capabilities. So we're doing quite well. We've only really just started um, halfway through last year. I think that what we've struck on something is something pretty compelling here. Uh, we would hope that what we are doing is representing our community to providers of compute resources in sensible ways and vice versa, representing those compute providers back out. And again, describing things that are useful in ways that can be implemented and then made widely available. Okay, so what are those things? So over 2019, we've focused on five major, we're calling them implementation studies. And of course, behind all of this is training. Training is behind everything that we do, and we'll talk a bit about that later on. But these are the very specific activities that are establishing research infrastructures um, that were the, the, the starting set, if you like, for us. And they're described here in terms of the overall concept of what they're trying to demonstrate. And the four um, domain-specific research infrastructure approaches here are Infrastructure for human gen genome access, sharing and archiving. I'll talk about that at the end because it's the most complex. Uh, interoperability with global data demonstrated through a, a program of work, including uh, Kids First uh, Data Commons in the US and a Zero Childhood Cancer program here in Australia. I'll get to that in a sec. Um, Non-model genome assembly and uh, non-model organism genome assembly and annotation. That's an example of our community engagement approach, our pathfinding approach, where we ask the community what's missing here. They say, we haven't got the infrastructure we need for non-model genome assembly and annotation. We then have a very comprehensive process of talking to them about what that is, and then um, we will work on how we implement that. And the fourth quadrant there is highly accessible tools and workflows. Um, a good example of that is a Galaxy platform. I'll give an example of what, exactly what we can do with that in a little bit. Um, 
we already have an established Galaxy platform. We've got ambitions for that platform to expand it out to new domains of tool support, particularly phylogenetics and metagenomics, um, but also connect into bioplatform instruments and connecting through to some of the more fundamental compute infrastructure that uh, biology researchers use, in particular Cloud Store, which is hosted by INET. And underneath all of these services, if you like, all these platforms, we have this concept of a bio cloud, which is whatever it needs to be in terms of, you know, on-premises and commercial cloud, uh, high performance computing, um, whatever's required in order to implement the, um, the services as we, as we describe them there. Okay, so I'll just go through these one by one and give you a bit more detail. So, Genome assembly and annotation has been a bugbear for people who are involved in it, just getting hold of the compute resources and the expertise and the tools and whatnot, um, as long as I've been involved in bioinformatics. And it's just a community that's really ripe for describing their problem in a way in which we can um, really formalise it, um, come to community agreement, and it's a large community of people involved in, in non-model uh, genome assembly and annotation, essentially everybody involved in agriculture and uh, and ecological or environmental research. Um, we can describe the problem, um, we can iterate through to a, um, a, the, the community um, and formalize the description of this piece of research infrastructure as a national asset and then work out how we can implement it. And that's exactly what we've done through to some, some fantastic work with Tiff Nelson and, and Jeff Christensen um, and Johan Gustafsson uh, here at the BioCommons who have over the course of about 12 to 18 months now, been really closely engaged with a large chunk of the community that's involved in genome assembly and annotation. Um, a series of web, of, uh, of web workshops with you know 90 odd participants has ended up in this genome annotation infrastructure roadmap for Australia version three. It's a really um, sophisticated, settled process that's produced this. And of course, it, we're in a position now to take this to compute providers around the country institutional and national and say, okay, here's what we know we need. How do we go about doing this? Um, how can we implement this research infrastructure, uh, computational research infrastructure in a way in which it is most useful for Australia's researchers and provide mechanisms of access to the community and the training around that as broadly as we possible can, possibly can. And you might not be able to see the detail in, um, uh, in that uh, table on the right there, but it does talk about the specific things that are going to happen and the order they are going to happen, um, identifying the key set of the set of key tools for data preparation, genome annotation, evaluation, et cetera, et cetera, um, that will result from us doing this road mapping and having this sort of bridging, if you like, role to the compute providers. Where we want to end up eventually is in something like, something like this, which is an architectural drawing of how we see things panning out. Um, I don't want to go through, it's, it's, a, it's a bit complex to just uh, drop into this talk, but basically we want to develop, a, or we are developing a genome annotation platform where researchers will be able to come, bring their genomes, um, which have reached a certain level of quality, uh, which have been assembled on some of the resources that we hope to make available, and then go through this very formal process in collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute and Ensemble to give those genomes the highest quality annotation they can possibly have. I'll leave that at that for the moment. So that's an example of this pathfinding process. We focused on genome assembly and annotation in the first instance because um, we've got large numbers of our community that we all interact with telling us daily that this is a problem, getting the resources that we need. But we will move on to new um, sub-disciplines or methodologies, I guess, uh, which are problematic and hurdles. Uh, and uh, in particular, we think we're going to be focusing on uh, metagenomics, um, metabolomics and proteomics uh, as communities and what can we do about essentially again describing, formally describing the requirements of those communities and then going about implementing the solutions to them. The second activity I want to talk about is this highly accessible tools and workflows and really if there are many bioinformaticians on this call this is really what a lot of us spend our days doing. It is um, building workflows, uh, debugging workflows, trying to get the tools to work, um, and then trying to get tools to work again, and trying to get that to happen on a variety of different infrastructures. And the, the, the aim of this is to try and consolidate our independent, if you like, efforts around the country into something that's communal. 
In that light, we described a, um, a program of work to a, a funding call from the ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, we've called it the, uh, the or it's the platforms program call under which you can ask for funding to provision platforms that provide broad-based tool and workflow expertise to a broad range of researchers. And we did exactly that. We assembled a pretty strong consortium around this that was University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, QCIF and UQ, the National Computational Infrastructure, Quasi Supercomputing, the Australian Access Federation, Arnet, and the Australian Research Data Commons courses, Conda, um, plus letters of support from a number, number of other institutes around these three areas. The first is to connect instruments to analysis on the cloud. The second is expanding and improving high, highly accessible uh, graphical user interface focused um, bring your own data platforms. That's, that's our um, nomenclature, I guess, for, the, for this set of platforms that we are, are building. Um, platforms that you bring your data to, all the tools and the visualization processes and, and workflows and whatnot um, are there or can be implemented there and shared there. And then when you're done, you can bring your data off um, and publish your paper. That's the plan. And number three here, expanding and improving high flexibility command line interface focus, bring your own data platforms. So this is in, uh, essentially the counter, um, the counterpoint to number two there. We've got GUI based platforms for doing analysis, workflow analysis, and command line focused um, platforms for doing analysis, all in concert with the, the compute providers listed down the bottom. here. So we had some good funding for that, um, uh, courtesy of the ARDC and of course bio platforms um, and the partners and we'll be starting this program of work uh, very, very soon. One of the, the graphical user interface platforms is, of course, Galaxy. I've talked about that um, uh, just before. Um, Galaxy has been something that we have been working on in Australia from NCRIS funding for about the past five years, five or six years, and that has culminated in the establishment of an Australian Galaxy instance, which is um, hosted between uh, QCIF at the University of Queensland, um, uh, Melbourne University and NCI using ARDC funded cloud resources. I've just put this in here to show you that it's quite a sophisticated infrastructure that, uh, that this platform rests on. We have a large uh, GPFS uh, fast file system backend storage connected to a number of workers at Brisbane and then a head node which runs the logic of the, of the web uh, interface and of course a database server which um, uh, keeps track of all the data that's being analysed um, through Galaxy. And we have federated this architecture so that jobs can either run in Brisbane locally or can be sent off to uh, the National Computational Infrastructure in Canberra at ANU or the University of Melbourne on the um, Nectar Research Cloud. So this is quite a sophisticated bit of kit now. Um, I, th I think that the process that we've taken here has been really forward looking because we can add in more worker nodes, if you like, from new participants as required. And we'll be doing that shortly with new partners who join our consortium. So that's, the, I guess, the, the, the national federation that we're doing. But you know, in concert with that, we're doing international federation of Galaxy. And this very complex long diagram here is meant to depict that we are working um, hand in glove with Galaxy in the US and Galaxy in Europe to share the large reference data sets and tool, uh, data, uh, tool repositories that we are all using. And we're edging closer and closer to a global standard between Australia, Europe and the US on a set of tools, um, and then there'll be about 7,000 of them that are made available across all those Galaxy instances and are consistent, so a workflow should run anywhere, and a set of reference data sets um, which will be many, many terabytes, which is shared in real time using this very clever distributed file system called uh, the CERN Virtual Machine File System. This has been a real win for us. It's this international federation, and it's a really good example of what we can do when we take a national approach from Australia and project ourselves outwards to Europe and US as a very capable um, country who can contribute and participate. Um, a good example of this working in practice was uh, just last week when we were able to um, do, demonstrate that within a, a small number of days, in fact, it was about three days, uh, we could replicate a sophisticated analysis of the coronavirus, um, uh, COVID-19 virus across Australia and Europe uh, and the US, uh, essentially in real time.
uh, initial analysis of COVID-19 data using Galaxy Bioconda and public research infrastructures. This is the US, this is the, uh, the EU cloud, and this is Australia's ARDC cloud. Um, so what the science was in this particular piece of work was to draw the re -raw, raw, sorry, raw read data from the published coronaviruses um, of the current outbreak of COVID-19. And there are four, I think, three or four published sequences um, to pull those from the sequence read archive, to assemble a COVID-19 genome from those, to use the assembled genome against other uh, coronavirus to estimate the timing for the most common recent ancestor, to do an analysis of variation between initial, sorry, individual isolates because we had the raw reads, we could actually go in beyond just the genome assembly, we could actually do a, a population diversity analysis between individual isolates of the, of the virus. Um, analyze identified spike protein substitutions from step four and then analyze the, uh, the major recombination um, uh, sites within the virus. Now I admit that I don't understand how all of this stuff works, um, but because we have this agreement on common infrastructure by which we can share tools and data assets, this web page here, which is a GitHub web page, is sufficient for anyone to do this on a compliant, if you like, Galaxy instance, which is Galaxy Australia, Galaxy uh, Europe, and, uh, and Galaxy US. And I was able to do this, and here is my history on Galaxy. If you haven't seen Galaxy, it works through this concept of, of transforming data through histories and each history is a chunk of work. So each of these is one of those scientific analyses and I'll just choose this one at random. Uh, the COVID-19 assembly, I'll go to that history. I was able to do this in the, over the course of a day and in fact that day was the computation, it wasn't me setting up the process. Um, and what I'm gonna show here is this, no, not that, this, um, visualization of the assembly of the coronavirus using Unicycler, which is a, um, a metagenome assembler. This set of contigs, which is identified here, and if you don't know the application, it doesn't really matter, apart from you produce a set of contigs from your assembly, and this allows you to visualize them, so you get the length and, the, um, and also, um, uh, obviously, any forking points in the assembly itself. This largest contig here is the coronavirus, and the sequence of this is 100% identical to that which was published um, by the, uh, the, the, um, the original researchers who isolated or, or used this isolate and did the sequencing back in January, early February this year. So this was pulled from the sequence re research, uh, sorry, the sequence read archive. Um, there is um, uh, short read and long read data in here. This is a high quality assembly. It's a full length coronavirus. Uh, 30 odd, 40,000 base pairs, I can't quite remember, um, with 100% identity to the published one. And that was a very, very easy thing to do. All I really needed to do was to uh, import the workflow from the paper and uh, it would go and fetch the data, assemble it using the tools that were available for the same set of tools. Um, and then I can visualize this and then I can do the further science, which is the, for instance, the, the isolate diversity. And I'm not gonna go through all of this now, but this was a very simple thing to do and that shows the power of agreement on a, um, a, a high level of research infrastructure, which allows you to then access a very sophisticated set of tools, workflows, methods and science, and then build on top of that. So if you wanted to, you can go and get new sequence uh, that's been published on different isolates and do more comparative analysis in this exact same uh, bioinformatics framework. And within a few days, we could publish a paper saying that a joint paper saying that we've uh, managed to co-analyze this identically across the three sites very, very rapidly. Um, I wanted to talk about um, research infrastructure for human genome sharing and archiving and, and access in Australia. Um, and it's easy to talk about that because it doesn't really exist in Australia. Uh, of course, the, uh, the Europeans have the European Genome Phenome Archive, and in the National Institutes of Health, there's dbGaP, which is the database of genomes and phenomes, which is essentially the, the sharing mechanism that those two um, nations or, or federations, of course, use to, to store and then share research genomes. In Australia, we don't have that. We generally send our genomes off to the EGA or to dbGaP. Uh, dbGaP is generally for NIH-produced genomes. Um, but that's not a, a sustainable proposition because, and I don't, haven't got time to visit Thomas's, um, Thomas Keane, who's the head of the EGA, his presentation here, but um, one of the major takeaways from 
a number of presentations that I've um, seen in the last couple of years is that in the very near future, 80% of human genomes or more are going to be clinically generated. And what that means in practice, um, and this is some data extrapolated from a paper published by Ewan Burney um, and uh, Kathy North a couple of years ago, is that although we have about probably 40,000 research genomes in Australia in different places around, um, around the country, that, that number is going to be dwarfed by what is coming from clinically produced um, genomes that are used for diagnosis. And here are the estimates that have come out of the, the produced by you and Bernie and from the Global Alliance is that in the very near future, we're going to be having tens and hundreds of thousands of cancer genomes and rare disease genomes produced. And if we don't have a way to consider these as a cohort, as a research cohort, we will have lost an enormous opportunity because the primary purpose of these genomes being produced is for diagnosis of a patient, not to be aggregated into a cohort for research purposes. So more and more, the, the fundamental data asset underlying human disease research and discovery is going to be clinically generated, and it's going to have restrictions around whether the data can move from Australia uh, overseas, there'll be sovereignty issues. Um, but more to the point, what we don't have is a mechanism by where we can use the huge investment in health for the benefit of research long-term, and that's a real challenge. And I, I'm going to jump ahead of myself by saying we don't have a solution for this and it's a, it's a problem for everybody else in the world. And in fact, the EGA um, are, are gonna end up with an enormous number of, you know, of, of genomes, of course, as well, and are wondering how to deal with that scaling. Um, but what we do need is a national approach to it. So we need a national approach to interact internationally and also to represent to the health agencies and the clinical initiatives and the state, and state clinical initiatives in Australia. And that's some of the work that we are doing with the biochemist. One nice piece of work um, around building virtual cohorts from Australian research genomes and international research genomes that we've been involved in is a program, um, and I've called it Kids First, but in fact it's zero in Kids First, zero childhood cancer in Australia in Kids First. This very uh, um, detailed slide here, and, and you've probably already guessed that I just took a poster and dumped it into my slide demonstrates what we're trying to do here. There's a large data commons of pediatric cancer sets in the US called Kids First at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. There's an increasingly, lab, sorry, increasingly growing cohort of Australian pediatric cancer cases here in Australia under the Zero Childhood Cancer Program. We would like to co-analyze those together so that we can get more statistical power across the Australian data sets, which are obviously only a 20 of or, or thereabouts of the size of the equivalents in the US. And there is strength in numbers, of course, through the, the sort of categorization that you wanna be doing with, uh, with children's cancer or, or any cancer. So this piece of work is being done through a commercial platform for analysis called Seven Bridges. Um, and they have a, a dedicated version of that called Cavatica, which we have implemented in Australia on the um, AWS cloud in Sydney, so that we can, and we have already, as of the last few weeks, co-analyzed Australian data sets in Australia against uh, US data sets in the US without either data set leaving its country of origin. They're co-analyzed up to a point where they can be integrated as VCS and statistically queried for subcategories of the cancer. I think this is a really exciting piece of work. We've also demonstrated that commercial platforms for genomics, human genomics can be very, very cost and time effective um, if we do it right. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about um, before I wrap up is the, the concept of a bio cloud. And this bio cloud is what are the things underpinning the services that we're implementing here, the platforms, whether it's Seven Bridges or Galaxy or, or a global assembly and annotation platform or, or a European genome, genome archive equivalent in Australia. Um, and, uh, and Steve Manos um, here at the Biocommons has, um, has been really um, pivotal in essentially making this bridge between what we know are the, the research sort of infrastructure challenges and how we can get them solved. And this, how we can get them solved on what, the on what is the bio cloud. It's, it's the, the group of resources that we think we can access and represent too sensibly, whether they be national or institutional, so that um, we can roll out these services to whoever needs them in the most accessible way. Remember, we're not buying computers, but coming back to this slide here, there's a lot of money being spent on digital data and re research platforms into the future through NCRIS. We're talking about a billion dollars of, um, 
it's projected over the next 10 years. So we really want to find a way to access that in a much better way than biology's been able to do uh, to date. This is, I guess, the concept uh, coming back to the Elixir slide here, where across we would uh, envisage across Australia, we have data assets and compute assets and, and workflows and tools and, and whatnot sort of seamlessly moving around across this fabric of interchangeable um, 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 compute resources uh, and training and skilled programs around that. And uh, I just pulled out this, uh, this quote um, that I used in that recent paper with Galaxy. Um, in an age of digital connectedness, open, highly accessible, globally shared data and analysis platforms have the potential to transform the way biomedical and biological research is done, opening the way to global research markets where the competition arises from deriving understanding rather than access to samples, data and tools. And this hasn't always been the case. It's often been the case that getting access to the data has been um, the privilege of the leading researchers. Um, we want to move beyond that. The ultimate idea of the data commons is that if we can have an open marketplace across tools and data, then the competition becomes around the intelligence of the interpretation. And that's where we would like to be. All of this requires a huge effort in workforce transition. Of course, coming back to this slide, we know these changes are coming. Um, if you talk to anyone in, in you know, an equivalent position, I guess, in the US or the EU, they'll say the same thing. We know these challenges are coming. Um, and Elixir particularly has an extremely sophisticated training program, as do we here in Australia, and um, which this webinar series is part of, uh, in order to uh, facilitate you know, the, the, the transitions across these categories that we know are coming. As an example, last year um, we had two um, really successful uh, um, uh, training programs implemented through a, a hybrid training um, um, mecha um, mechanism or vehicle that, uh, that Christina and Jeff have been primarily responsible for developing. Uh, one around snake make and next flow, and one around phylogenetic trees for beginners. And both of those were delivered through this concept of uh, a, a starting expert who trains other experts at multiple sites and then a, um, a, 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 um, a delivery of, of the workflow across all of those sites at the same time um, with local facilitators, uh, an expert doing the webinar, if you like, or the, 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 uh, delivering the material, and multiple students at each of those sites learning how to do these things. And just recently, early this year, we were lucky enough to have a, um, um, or, or to be able to, to put together a hybrid training um, series with, uh, I can't remember the name and Christina will have to, but the, uh, the developer of CIRCOS and visualization of genomes and, and that happened really quickly, it was really successful. And I think this is a really powerful way of us scaling out training. Okay, so I'm nearly there. Global participation, how do we do that? Well, we can do it in two ways. We can, we can do it through top-down agreements and we can do it through bottom-up um, activities. And it's by far my preference to do it through bottom-up activities. Um, nevertheless, we are currently drafting a formal agreement to allow co collaboration across a range of activities with Elixir. And in honesty, Elixir and the Australian Biocommons are very similar entities. They're trying to do the same thing. They're coordinating um, and, um, and, uh, and, and helping things happen and making, you know, and, 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 um, um, encouraging and using some funding to make training programs happen and whatnot. They're, they're doing the same sort of job. Uh, we envisage the Biocommons will look uh, a fair bit like Elixir in the not too distant future. And, uh, and happily, you know, Elixir would really like to have us as a partner. This was a, publish, a story published on the Elixir website um, late last year. Um, and you can probably see that's actually a picture of me in there giving a talk at Elixir. Um, they would like to work out how they can do the same things that they are doing at the European level more internationally. And we are in a fantastic position to, uh, to be that international partner. Okay, how do you get involved in all this? So we have a site, of course, biocommons.org.au. I think Christina linked to that at the start of this webinar. On that site, there's a participate link and you can click on that and that'll give you more information about getting involved in our, um, our research community efforts, uh, particularly around genome assembly and annotation, as I talked about, but also now moving into phylogenomics and metabolomics and proteomics. You can just start using Galaxy Australia tomorrow. Um, it's, it's available, it's highly capable, it's consistent with Galaxy in the US and with Europe. 
And as I say, because we've got a essentially a global federation of this going on, we can do some really sophisticated things really quickly. And we did that with the COVID virus. Our website is a bit basic at the moment. We, we haven't uh, started up um, too long ago. Uh, this will improve and it will be much, much clearer as to, uh, to how to get involved in things. But at the moment, go onto the website, click on participate. If you're interested in any of those things, please send us an email or get us in communication with us. You can subscribe to the monthly newsletter. There's a link there. Um, and of course, you're welcome to email me um, at any time with specific questions around the biocommons, how can I get involved? How can we get involved You know, at institutional level? Um, and we welcome any of your contact. And with that, I will stop there and hand back to Christina. Thank you so much. It was a whirlwind tour of the Australian Biocommons, Andrew. <laughs> All 60 slides, I'm pretty proud. <laughs> uh, so we have time for a couple of questions if anyone has any in mind. Um, Andrew, you can see the question pane as well. Amongst the tools, do you have a system for life cycle management of samples? Well, no, we don't, unfortunately. So, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think that, uh, just speaking briefly, honestly here, data management is by far the most undercooked of the things that we are doing. And this is actually, part of that is why it's been so slow with the, um, the human genome sharing and archiving, because where you actually keep stuff long-term um, and, uh, and when you retire data assets, I guess, um, is a really hard problem. So um, I, I probably can't give you a lot more than that, Mark, apart from we do intend to um, to maybe start up a community around you know, data management, whatever that means, into the future. But it's a really hard problem and we don't have a solution. Um, there was another comment from Niharika, which was saying, just thanks for an inf informatics webinar. About, oh, my pleasure. Yeah, just saying thank you. <laughs> Uh, another very good question from Sigurd. It looks as though your fact finding was very focused on Eurus in Europe. What about China? Look, that's a great question. Um, and I won't, um, I won't gild the lily. I, I just don't think we have a strong connection into what is happening into China or mechanisms of doing it. And of course, um, now is not the time to be doing it anyway. But um, that, that's a really good question, which is what is our regional presence? Yeah, because we're actually in Asia. We're not in the US or Europe. And yet we're culturally aligned at the research level, at least much more with the US and Europe. We look to US and Europe because that is really where the research infrastructure wins are being made in this space, but that won't always be the case. And I'm gonna say again, I don't know the answer to um, what we do about a stronger presence in Asia yet, but we will need to into the future. Uh, I'm sorry, just back to Mark, he's thinking more of the limbs, inventory logistics rather than the data. Um, not really, Mark. That, uh, I think individual bioplatforms platforms nodes will be thinking about that stuff. Is there a, can you do a national approach to that? Well, maybe, but it really is a long way off, I would say. Each of the data producers has their own mechanism for, um, uh, for recording samples and, and sharing um, you know, metadata on the samples. I'm not the expert on it. In fact, Jeff uh, Christensen knows a lot more than I do about data management and, and the metadata sort of challenge, which is maybe what you're referring to. Um, and maybe that will be the topic of a future seminar. All right, well, I think that's probably all we have time for today. Andrew put his contact details up. He's always willing to uh, answer questions and um, you have a few different channels that you can contact us via as well. Here's some on Twitter uh, or visit the website to find out more. So, um, I'd like to once again express our thanks to you, Andrew, for spending your time to explain the um, Australian Biocommons and draw the presentation to a close there. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks, Jason. <laughs> thanks so much for watching today. We hope you found it useful. And thanks also goes to our funding organisation, the Australian Biocommons, uh, is enabled by INCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. We also acknowledge significant partnerships with the ARDC and RNET that support us to deliver a truly national um, capability. So until next time, goodbye. <laughs>